I said, well, Lord, you're right. And then as the Lord's put it all together for me, I began to see and uh, how God does with this message preached here tonight based on all that that he's done this week and how he's really moved me to this message tonight as I thought about, boy, how this has been good ground this week and all the seed that the sower has sown on this good ground this week. And uh, Matthew, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13, but I want to back up to Matthew chapter 12 and uh, begin reading in uh, verse 46. Well, really, you could look at, uh, at verse number 1 of chapter 13. First three words, it says, the same day. Well, just the way I'm geared up, uh, that made me want to see what had already been happening that day. Uh, so I backed up to chapter 12 and verse 46. If you found your way there, say amen. And the word of God says, while, yet he, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hands toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Boy, ain't you proud tonight the Lord Jesus feels that way about us. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. I thought about of all the attributes that we see in the Lord Jesus Christ as we saw Him, as we follow Him through the Gospels, as He was here, as He walked on the earth, and no doubt all the things that stand out. We're so thankful tonight for His mercy. We're so thankful for His grace. We're so thankful for His love. We're so thankful for His compassion. Hey, it's, uh, it's Friday night, so we just well get comfortable. Amen. Let me get out of that coat. And uh, that coat fit me before I left the house, but I ain't sure it does now. It's a little binding, amen. But uh, as we think about all his attributes, I believe, and uh, maybe one of his greatest attributes that really stood out to me that I wanted to really bring to my people, and I believe God would have us bring here tonight, uh, maybe his greatest attribute was his focus, Amen. Those things that he was focused on, no doubt his focus on his ministry, his focus on his mission, and his focus on his message. And if you follow him through the gospel, people were constantly trying to distract him away from what his mission was. Everywhere he went, there were all kinds of people trying to distract him. His foes were constantly attacking him for who he was, trying to distract him from from his mission, his own followers. They, they were constantly contradicting him. He was all about telling them there's got to be a cross before there can be a crown. His disciples just wanted him to kill everybody, amen. They said just get rid of all of them, set up an earthly kingdom here. We'll rule and reign right here. And even as we find here in these verses in chapter 12, even his own family, uh, what could be a good distraction, but where he was and and that that he was doing and preaching and teaching, this became a distraction. There was always someone trying to distract him from his mission. But thank God, the Lord Jesus Christ never lost his focus. He stayed fixed on that purpose that he had before him. I'm going to ask my people Sunday morning, and I guess I'll just start by asking you tonight, are you a focused person? Let me just go on and tell you, when it comes to the cause of Christ, and living for Jesus Christ in these days, you better learn to be a focused person. To be focused on God's plan and God's purpose for your life. Because hear me, honey, everybody else is going to have a plan and purpose for your life. So you better be focused on that that you know God has for you. Well, I've learned uh, just the short time. I, I've only been pastoring for almost five years. only been preaching for six years this June but, but I have learned this as a preacher and as a pastor if you're not focused on your call uh, you won't last very long on your call I tell you right now there's always somebody ready to tell you what you're doing wrong can I get an amen one of my young helpers back here have I got a handkerchief back there on that back row if you would get it for me or I'll be done spit all over myself is there a handkerchief back here Praise God. Thank you, Brother Chuck. Your ministry just goes on and on, man. I 
thought about how many is always somebody ready to tell you of what you're doing wrong in your purpose or in your plan. And, and even sometimes folk in the church, uh, folk can mean, the, they can mean to do well, but boy, we can make a mess in our well-doing sometimes. Uh, I've thought about even all the, the, the churches that have been here this week, and, and, and I want to put in a word for my preacher brethren right now, and I want to encourage you, be focused into that God's called you to do, because fellas, I promise you, there's always going to be somebody uh, ready to tell you where you're coming up short, always going to be somebody to tell you about a visit you didn't make, a, a problem you didn't fix, a message that you got wrong, and, and not being focused will finish you before you ever really get started. Anybody ever wanted to quit on Monday morning? Amen. Whew. What keeps us? What brings this, Brother Steve? What, what is this? Well, I believe one of, the, uh, one of the main distractions the devil has in this day is this ministry of distraction. And as I search uh, out the Word of God and as I follow the Lord Jesus and I, I see His focus, I, I realize that there were so many distractions that came against Him, not only from His foes and from His followers, but from His own family. And as I began to search out the, even the meaning of this word distraction, I found all the way back in the 16th and the, and the 17th century uh, the Europeans had a form of torture that they used. Uh, they would take a person that they were going to punish or, or they had sentenced to death. Uh, they would put him out in a field and they would tie his arms and his legs to four different horses. And then they would tell those horses to pull and, and what would happen, they would be pulled in four different ways. And what they called this was death by distraction pulled in four different ways. And I thought about where we are as a church, uh, the things that pull us away, that pull at us and that distract us and that causes us to lose our focus. And I just guess tonight, if we'd be honest, we could all say we know what it is to feel like that life is pulling us apart. And I wonder the moments of blessing that we miss because of the distractions that take over in our life or this pulling in so many different ways. I can promise you after a week like this, how God has moved, how He has manifested Himself, and no doubt we all tonight realize we've been in His presence. Church, hear me tonight. The devil is not going to take this laying down. And it sure is, it's easy for us to say this is the last night of revival. If we've had revival, this is the first night of revival. How do I know? Because look who come walking in right there. Amen. If we've really had a move of God, this will not be the last night. This will be the very beginning. And, and hear me, church, the devil will not take these days laying down. He, he's getting his helpers ready right now. He, he's already looking to see if you've got the armor on, if you're staying focused on the blood trail, uh, if you've killed some giants. He's already getting some more giants ready to bring to your valley of Elah. He's going to try to get into the flock and one blade of grass at a time to try to move you away. How you know that, Brother Steve? Because the Lord Jesus told me in John chapter 10 where we was last night just what the devil's going to do. John 10, 10 says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now they would use four horses to pull us in different ways. Well, right there it says, The thief, he cometh, he steals, he kills, and he destroys. These would be the four horses of the devil as he tries to bring distractions into our life to rob us of that that God has done. And as I begin to think about, as I look back over my own life, I have to admit tonight the moments of blessing that I've missed that no doubt were murdered by the distractions of the devil. The things that were pulled apart. But thank God in Matthew chapter 13, the Lord Jesus has a word for the distracted. 
Look at verse number 1, chapter 13. The same day went Jesus out of the house, sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. The fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground, brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, those that can focus, focus on these things. Then look at verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. I've said all I've said to really uh, get to some words there in verse 24. A man which sowed, sowed good seed in his field. After all the seed that has been sown this week, I, I just want to just entitle this message tonight, What are you going to do in your field? What are you going to do in your field? I love what it says here in verse number 3 of chapter 13. He spake many things unto them in parables. We know that the Lord Jesus was the great preacher of illustrations. We know what a parable is. It's an earthly story with a heavenly message in it. And the Lord Jesus loved to use illustrations in His preaching. A, a, a message that's got an illustration in it is like a room that you put a window in. Amen. It'll let light in on that that you couldn't see. And, and it'll give you a good handle on that that He's trying to say. That's what He said in verse 3. Behold. Y'all know what behold means in the Greek? It means looky, looky. Amen. And in this message we see a sower that went forth to sow. Boy, I love that. That sowing there. And, and that sower that went forth to sow. Of course, that being that agricultural term and the, the picture that it is. And to sow actually means to scatter. I love this as the Lord Jesus was, was about to preach this message uh, on what it is to focus in on that word that is sown into the fields or into the lives of, of people. And, and, and I love that scattering because that's just what life does, man. Life scatters us. We have our plans and they get scattered. We make our promises. They get scattered. And then we all encounter our problems and how scattered we are. How did we all end up here in Redwater, Texas tonight? Have y'all stopped and thought about how God has put all of this together? I've been asking myself every night, as I drove from the hotel, as nice as I ever stayed in, thank you very much. But as I've made my way from that hotel to here every night, thinking, Lord, what in the world am I doing here? You just don't get a boy from where I am and a bunch like y'all from where y'all are. And all these churches to come together and for us to get in on what we've got in on this week. Unless there's been an unseen hand doing a work behind the scene. Preached a friend of mine that was raised up in the mountains of Virginia. He told me, he said, uh, he said my grandparents raised me and my sister. And he said, man, well, he said, I, I guess 
we was poor, we just didn't know it because everybody was poor. And he said, I, I can remember my sister was, was several years older than me and said, and said her sixth grade class was going to present a play. And said she came in and told my grandma and grandpa that, that they were going to do a school play. And he said, I didn't even know what that was. He, he said, I was five or six years old. And said, we, we went down to the little schoolhouse and, and said, I walked in, sat there by my grandmother. And he said, man, they had a curtain down. And he said, about that time, somebody come out and held up a sign and said, Act One. Said, man, they raised that curtain and said, they began to act that play out. He said, man, I was up on the edge of my seat. I never had seen anything like that. Said, about that time, the curtain come down. I thought, oh, no, is it over? He said, and even though the curtain was down, I could hear folks moving around behind the stage and folks moving stuff and folks talking. He said, about that time somebody come out and held a sign up, said act two, said they raised that curtain up. And he said, man, the stage looked different. Different people came out, said, but the story began to make more sense. And he said, I didn't get very far along in this thing with God that I realized there was a lot of times in my life the curtain was down. I didn't know what he was doing but I knew there was something going on behind that curtain and in God's timing they would raise that curtain up and what didn't make no sense to me would begin to make sense what he's saying brother Steve I ain't exactly sure what all I got in on this week but this one thing I do know once I was blind and now I can see Thank God for the scattering. Who'd have ever thunk it? Amen. Now Matthew chapter 13, these verses that we've read, and these four types of fields, these four types of ground, these four types of soil, if you will, it's been preached before, and, 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 and I have no problem preaching it like this. That this represents four kinds of people. This seed that we find in verse number 4, this seed by the wayside uh, could be preached those who hear the gospel, but they, they don't respond to the gospel. They just stay in their sin despite of the sowing of the seed. It just never sinks in. It just falls by the wayside. And then those stony places. That could be very well description of those who listen to the Word and and maybe get caught up in emotion or, or maybe the moving of a service and, and they're led by men and not by the Spirit and they walk down an aisle and somebody asks them, do they want to go to heaven? Well, sure. Or, or do you not want to go to hell? No, I don't want to go to hell. And, and maybe just in their own emotion, but they, they never get lost. See, if you ain't ever been lost, you ain't ever been saved. Now, I walked down an aisle and I was nine years old. Because one of my buddies walked down the aisle when he was about 10 year old. And I know Brother Hal, I know him. He was my pastor. And, and I know he didn't, I know he did the best he could with what he had. But, but I don't ever remember asking him asking me about my sin or, or if I was lost. I, I just remember him saying a prayer and getting up and standing me up and telling everybody that I'd got saved. And my mama and my grandmama cried a lot. And I ran on that from the time I was nine years old till I was 16 years. First time in my life I ever remember being under Holy Ghost conviction was on a Sunday night when I was 16 years old. You say, Brother Steve, what's the age of accountability? I don't know and you don't either. Salvation is a work of the Lord. The gospel never got real to me till I was 16 years old. That's when it pricked my heart and I knew I was in a mess. I knew that I was a sinner and that if I died, I'd die a lost man in my sin. But the devil kept carrying me back to when I was nine years old. I'd walk down an aisle and I've heard it said over and over, just say the prayer, just say the prayer, just say the prayer. Honey, saying the prayer ain't got no more impact than me ordering that meatball sandwich today, man. I'm telling you right now, honey, the prayer... The prayer is not with this right here. It's the cry that comes from right here. Had a young man in my church dating one of my young girls. Now I got a crop of teenage girls. 
I ain't got a lot of boys, but I tell my people, it's just like bait in a dove field, amen. They'll show up for long. I had a young man dating one of our, my young girls, and he was a lost man, came out of a broken home, mother and dad, uh, both had done time in prison, both of them had, had strung out on drugs, and this boy had never been to, to a church, and he started coming. Name was Justice. How about that? Oh, justice man, I, I watched him in first few services and I could tell whenever he seen him unsnap my chain, man, it scared him to death. I, I'd run by him, a little sweat would get on him, a little spit would get on him. He didn't know, man, if I was crazy, if I was drunk, if I was what? I am a little crazy and I'm a whole lot drunk, amen. But Steve, you quit drinking, no, I just change bottles, amen. Oh, justice got under that preaching of the Word of God. He knew the only way that he could see he could see Mallory. He I knew he had to be at church to, to see her. And, and boy, I'm telling you what, one Sunday morning, son, heaven came down, man. I'm telling you, God got to walking up and down the aisles of Greatest Mission Baptist Church. That old boy, he, he, he ain't looked at me good in the eye, man, for six months. But Brother David, he started out that door that Sunday morning, man. He had tears running down his face. He said, Brother Steve, he said, I'm going to talk to you tonight. And I said, no, honey. Let's talk right now. That boy stood there and you could tell, Brother Todd, even the balance of the scales, he was hanging between heaven and between hell right there. As he stood there at that door, that battle was going on inside of him. Was he going to go the way he came or was he going to follow that preacher? We broke and headed toward my office. I sat there, led him down the Roman road, showed him all that. He prayed a prayer. What do you think, preacher? Only God knows, but I don't know that whenever he made that step from that door that his heart didn't cry out to God's heart if salvation didn't settle in on him right there. If the devil ever made you doubt your salvation, I ain't even, man, I've went plumb off my message. Amen. He told me somebody needed some help tonight, needed some free relief. Or the devil and those doubts. You tell me you ain't ever doubted your salvation. I doubt whether you've ever been saved. The devil will come against you with doubts on what you did and did you do this and did you say the right thing and, and if you quit enough and if you done this and he can have you up and he can have you down man he can have you not knowing anything boy my Bible tells me my God is not the author of confusion honey when he got to coming against me whether or not I saved or not man I was just crazy enough I took God at his word when he comes at me with stuff like that I ain't too proud man I bow my head right there I say, God, if I've missed this thing in any way, God, I ain't a dying and going to hell for nobody. I said, Lord, if I've missed you, God, you saved me right now. I'm not too proud. I'm not too proud. Oh, there's somebody here tonight. Your pride's keeping you from closing your eyes and sleeping over the finished work of Christ tonight. God will do one or two things when you ask Him that. He'll carry you the place He saved you. Holy Ghost conviction will be to deal with your heart that you a lost man, woman, boy, or girl. Honey, if you ain't got a place, you ain't got Jesus. You may not remember if it's hot or cold, winter or summer, day or night, but you'll remember the place where the Lord met you. Yes, say some who, no doubt, or could be that stony ground. They listen to the Word. They, they respond by praying a prayer, but but then the, the, the life becomes too hard. They, they go back to what they were because there never was a change in what they were. Or there's that those, that, those that come among the thorns. These very well could be those who are attached to this world, attached to its wages, attached to its ways, attached to its wealth. And just like thorns, life just chokes them out. Then there's that good ground. Well, that's what we all want to be, amen. Want to be that good ground, that that produces that 
hundredfold return. Well, Brother R.G. Lee, he was, he was the preacher at Bellevue Baptist Church before Dr. Adrian Rogers came there. Brother Lee was a prince of preachers, huh? preached under such power. And Brother Lee preached back in the 40s and the 50s. He, he had a message. He preached out of these four people in these four grounds. And Dr. Lee, he, he even believed that you could preach it that most likely in any church that every time you get up to preach three kinds of ground bad, one kind of ground good. Dr. Lee preached very well. Could be three quarters of the congregation is lost and never has been saved. He preached that one morning I read in his book. and He had preached that in a church one morning and said an older lady got to the door and she said, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't appreciate that. I don't appreciate you making that kind of accusation against our church. I, I don't appreciate you saying that that many lost people could be around me. She said, I didn't like that message. Dr. Lee said, I looked at her and said, well, the devil didn't like it neither, so classify yourself. Amen. No doubt this message could be the, preached in that context of people, but I wonder. It seemed like the Lord just kindly brought it into my life. Could it also be a message that about four conditions that maybe all of our hearts may experience at any given time? Is it possible that through a day we're, we're able to experience all four different types of soil? Of the condition of this ground that we find. This soil or this field really be in our hearts and, and the condition of our fields, the condition of our hearts. And I just want to encourage you in this tonight after all the sowing that's been done this week in song and message and fellowship and the love of the saints. I, I just want to ask you this tonight on this. I'm not going to call it the last night. I'm going to call it the first night. What are you going to do with your feet? Because I've already put you on notice the thief is coming and he's coming to steal and to kill and to destroy. All that seed that's been sown into your life this week, the enemy is coming to have his way with that seed. To steal it, to kill it, and to destroy it. What about your seed and your field? Let me just give you a few things about this seed. I believe we see in verse number 4, this seed can be snatched away. Verse 4 says, And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. This statement, devoured them up, has the same meaning of they snatched them away. And the seed that the sower sows, what this is a picture of that can take place in our own fields. Uh, the seed that the Holy Spirit has come your way and sown in you this week, the enemy means before you can ever get it, before you can ever get it covered up, before you can ever get, get it sealed to your heart, it gets snatched away. In other words, just like a thought, it's there and then it's gone. I'll turn up 54 years old in September. I know that's hard to believe. I know I don't look it. Amen. I'm just blessed that way. So I have entered the ranks of a senior citizen. And there's some things that I've discovered. Thank you whoever said, my goodness, you don't even know what that's about. Praise your Lord. But I have discovered some things about getting older. This thing of remembering and thoughts. They have a way of being snatched away. Is there anybody here tonight that's done one of these? When all over the house, where is my glasses? Have you seen my glasses? Every time, honey, I put them down, Twyla, stay out of my office. Every time I lay something down, you pick it up, I can't find nothing. Oh, cell phones. I don't know how many times I tell you I've walked around looking for my cell phone while I've had it in my hand, amen. Car keys. 
Lord, help. Go from having them to losing them, being snatched away. Hear this preacher, honey. Satan is out to snatch the good seed from you. He has his birds of prey. He has his principalities, those rulers of darkness, those that work out of the high places that he means to devour that which has been planted in your life this week. He means to snatch it away. I've thought about those things that he's got away from me because I did not guard my field. And I'm so saddened tonight that when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and I'll have to see the blessings that God gave me in a seed that I did not treasure them and I did not uh, give all my all to make sure that they were taken care of, that I allowed the devil to snatch them away and all I ever saw it as was a seed and if I'd have done with it what God meant for me to have done with it, it would have been a blessing like I could have never have even imagined receiving. Well, now when we go out to eat, and I'm amazed as we go into restaurants, you watch families come in, and a husband's got his phone, and a wife's got her phone, and the children have their phone, and they sit at a table. I know waiters and waitresses hate to see us with phones in our hands because they can't get us pried away from them. And what used to be conversation, y'all remember when we used to talk around the table? Man, at my mama's house, you may not slow down no other time, but at supper time, you's coming to the table, man. And you wasn't bringing nothing with you but you. And that's where you found out about folk. Well, that was a blessing of time. And, and there was just something about supping uh, around that table. But church, we're in a day where the devil is using distractions to remove that good seed, to snatch it away from us. And honey, I promise you this, uh, one of the greatest uh, fatalities of our day are the times that God gave us that we could have been conversing with each other when we could have reached out and touched a hand and we're occupied with somebody on the world wide web or, or reading this or playing that or punching a button here. I'm talking talking about that that's snatched away. Boy, the seed of the Word of God that's been sown this week. That's what preaching is. That's what preaching does. It's the sower sowing that seed. Boy, in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts chapter number 8, when that divine scattering takes place in the first church and, and old Philip ends up in Samaria and, and old Philip hits the ground and, and most of the time when a preacher ends up somewhere he didn't expect to be with people he didn't even want to be with and he has no idea what God's got for him. I tell you what, fellas, it's always right to just preach. said, Philip went out in the city of Samaria preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And there was great joy in that city. The word of God was preached to them. They received the word of God. And the response that came from it, the word of God changed their lives and it brought joy into their lives. Here at Redwater, at First Baptist Church, here at, at Redwater and these other churches, a uh, uh, lighthouse at Sims and, and Greatest Mission and all the churches that are represented here tonight, Every time you hear the Word of God preached, uh, it's the Holy Spirit sowing that good seed in your field. And, and I promise you, during the sowing process, and, and then after the seed gets there, the, the devil will immediately begin to try to snatch that seed from you. I'm going to challenge my people Sunday morning, and I've got it wrote down in my notes like this. To get to our church, uh, we're on a, we're on a four lane 278 west that runs from Tupelo all the way to Batesville, Mississippi. And if you're coming, most of my folk is coming from Pontotoc out to, to where we are and they have to go by Walmart to get on the four lane to come to our church. And I thought about 
how the seed, the, the devil looks to snatch it. And I thought about all the seed that's been sown. The devil means to snatch it away from you before you ever get out of the parking lot. He means to get it out away from you. So I'm going to challenge my people. I, I'm going to challenge them Sunday morning. I'm going to say, you really want to mess the devil up? When y'all get in the car, when you walk out of the church this morning, I don't want the first statement to be, where y'all want to eat? I want from the church to at least to Walmart, y'all talk about whatever I preached. Y'all talk about the message that morning. Begin to try to take care of that seed that the Holy Spirit gave you. And let the seed settle in before it gets snatched away. Uh, this seed that gets snatched. And, and, and then it don't only get snatched, uh, there's a seed that, that I believe gets scorched. Verse 5 and 6 talks about those stony places that had not, not, not much earth. And it's, as sure as there's a seed that can be snatched away, there's a seed that verse 6 says when the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they, they withered away. And if our churches have got in a shape, this is the shape they're in. The seed is sown in our fields, and even that that's not snatched away, it, it, it's scorched away because we have no root system with that that God has established in us. We got so much going on that we just never get grounded in the good seed that God has given us. This could very well be the condition for all of us who, who find ourselves so busy, but also our lives are so barren. Busy, but barren. We got a lot going, but we really doing nothing. Amen. And this seed has the appearance of life, but it has no root system. And what a root system does, it, it's a picture of commitment. And I thought about all these young people that have been in these services this week and what a blessing it's been and what a challenge that is for us older folk in the church in these days because these young people, they're a picture of young plants and if these young plants are not tended uh, or when they begin to sprout and when they begin to grow, the, the heat will burn them up. How I pray for our folk who are raising children in these days and and these are days it's not just parents raising them, but there's a lot of grandparents who are raising children in these days. And if they have no root system, then they'll have no stability. And, and we don't ever need to forget that the priorities in our kids' lives will be based over what priorities they see in our lives. I don't know that I've ever been in a meeting. I know I have. Where I've had so many folk come up and tell me in a week's time, preacher, I ain't been in church in this many years. Preacher, I ain't been to a revival meeting in this many years. But Brother Steve, I'm telling you, God has done a work in my heart right now. And I'm telling you, Brother Steve, this is a brand new start. And boy, I thought, that's revival, man. That's victory, man. See, that's not just your testimony now. But now you've started living out a testimony in front of your children, in front of your kids. And last Sunday morning, they might not have known if y'all was coming to the Lord's house. But this Sunday morning, when they see Daddy getting up, saying, if I not got a clean t-shirt, amen. And you think about that for the rest. There'll be a benchmark in those kids' lives. That maybe when they're standing at your casket one day, they'll say, well, I know this. I remember at a revival meeting when a bunch of churches came together back in yonder around 2016. He said, I saw God do a work in my mama and daddy's lives. Our lives turned completely around. We went from one way to another way. Boy, that'll begin to establish. That'll begin to establish them. The sad thing about our churches and, and the sad thing, the most asked question to, in churches around Mississippi. Now, I ain't sure about Texas, but 
preachers here this morning. Where's old brother so and so? What happened to sister so and so? Preacher, why ain't they here anymore? Well, verse 6 says, When the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. Put that in a little redneckology. When it got hot, they got out of the kitchen, man. And I'm telling you right now, if God has done a work in your field this week, if there's some seed been sown, honey, you can get ready. It's fixing to get hot. The sun's fixing to come out. you fixing to go through some things you hadn't been through in a long time. But even in the midst of the battle, just go on and stop. Go to praising God and say, Well, glory, the devil has showed up in my life. That must mean the one that I was walking with. Now I done got the button heads with him. Glory to God in the highs. So many, so many who are just looking for a reason to get out. My soul, I've had, man, I've had so many folks, they come faithful and then they join the church. That's almost like it's a get out of hell free card or something. Amen. FBI can't find them tonight. What is that, Brother Steve? No root system. No grounding. No root system. And the sad thing is, church, we can't let the people take all the blame for this. The pulpit and the pew are responsible for these baby Christians. They babies, man. They act they got baby ways. They gonna go to a heater and they gonna touch it and it's gonna burn the fire out of them. But when they get burnt, they need somebody standing there with their arms open saying, Come on, honey, come on, it'll be all right. We've shot our wounded. We've kicked our hurting. We've given up on folk too much. Because they ain't ready when the heat gets turned up, man. Boy, I've had those who, but boy, I tell you what, man, I'm thankful for those who they in, son. They in, their root system is being established. Folks say, Brother Steve, how many of y'all run in y'all church? I say, man, we run five or six hundred. We just don't catch all of them, amen. And I've preached to more folk this week than I've ever preached to. But I got my tater chip eaters in my church. That's what I call them, man. I said, they coming, man. It don't matter if you're preaching, if you're praying, if you're praising God, or if you're eating tater chips, man, they going to be there. So if you're a tater chip eater tonight, glory to God for you. Be faithful in your place. Boy, they see that gets snatched. They see that gets scorched. They see that gets strained. Boy, verse 7 talks about that that fell among those thorns. The thorns sprung up and choked them. Verse 22 says, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world. The deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. The cares of this world there in our King James Bible, that, that can be translated the worries of this world. I tell you what the devil will do. He'll use the worries of this world to become a distraction to you that will strangle you, that will choke you. Oh, I tell you what, I, I'm praying, I've been praying, I thought about it all evening. Boy, I believe we've seen the Holy Ghost do a lot of Heimlich maneuvers this week, amen. A Holy Ghost Heimlich. I like the sound of that. Son, some of you come in here Sunday night, you so choked up by the things of this world, you so strangled by the cares of this world, the worries of this world. You know something about worry? It's the craziest thing you'll ever do. What a waste of time. We spend our time worrying about something that ain't even happening. It doesn't say that we'll be choked out by the responsibilities of this world. 
Now, if you got a house payment and a car payment and 22 kids to feed, man, you got some responsibility. That ought to choke you out. But it don't say that. It says the cares, the, the worries of this world. That's what to choke you out. Boy, I tell you what, thank God that the Holy Ghost, uh, He knows the Heimlich Maneuver and our churches need to go back to letting folk know uh, if they're strangled by the bondage of this world, there's a Holy Ghost who will set you free and He'll release you from your bondage. But we live in a day that everybody wants to do something. He ain't bothering me now. He might bother you, but He ain't bothering me. We had a Christmas meal at our church and a guy grilled us some steaks and I was sitting at one table and directly I heard everybody on one end of the fellowship hall going crazy, man. One of my ladies, Miss Shauna Tudor, she is, that, that steak was hung in her throat and she stood up and, and she was already starting to turn blue. Y'all know what everybody was doing? Somebody do something. Somebody do something. Somebody do something. But wasn't nobody doing nothing. We're living in a day that we want to be good ground, but we're sitting around folk that's being strangled by the cares of this world. And we've stopped being a hands-on church. We've become a somebody do something church. Oh, super dog, here I come to save the day, man. I run across the room. I got behind her. I got my fist right there. Poof, poof. Third time. Poof. That's two years ago. Sunday mornings during our fellowship time, Shona Tudor will come up and hug my neck and say, Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. See, you'll be amazed if you'll quit being a somebody do something Christian to get your hands on somebody that's strangling Christian. And if you've had revival this week, it'll not be all about you. It'll start to be about somebody else out yonder who's needing what you got. Well, Steve, I just can't. I'm very quiet. Thank God for you. We need quiet people. That makes balance out for loud mouths like me. Brother Steve, I can't be a witness. Anybody can be a witness. Brother Steve, I'm not gifted in the Bible. The only gift you're going to have is what the Holy Ghost gives you anyway, honey. You're not going to sit down and figure that out in your thinking. It's going to be dark to you till He turns the lights on for you. But I tell you what He'll do. He'll give you enough that you can shout till Jesus comes and let somebody else know what He did for you. How do you present a gospel preacher? That's one beggar telling another beggar where he can get a piece of bread, man. You know when Andrew and John, the first two disciples that got saved, when the Lord Jesus saved them, Andrew immediately won't see his brother Simon Peter saved. He went and saw Simon. Oh, brother Steve, I bet Andrew, I bet he stood there and gave a witness for 45 minutes. Word of God says he ran and got his brother and said, Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Brother Steve, will that turn out all right? I believe Simon Peter turned out all right. Amen. I say, preacher, you ain't got to explain. You can't explain it all. But I tell you what you can do all day tomorrow. We had a time this week. Where at, man? Down there, they was churches in. Boy, this brother's church was there. And that preacher's, you say, boy, them preachers, they done sat under preaching all week. These old boys, don't none of y'all be not thinking you're going to eat quick Sunday now. These old boys is about to die to preach, man. Son, they pawing, man. They, they just the chains on them and they waiting on somebody to unsnap a chain. Boy, if you just be sensitive to who God puts in your path, 
between now and Sunday morning. You just say, y'all to come and see. Y'all to come and see. Old Brother Mew back yonder told me the other night, he said, man, when I got saved, he said, the two counties turned out to see me get back. said, they didn't know God saved nothing like me. <laughs> Brother Mew's wife told me tonight, said he'd come out Sunday night, went to get his stuff on, said, I believe I'm going to go to church tonight. He ain't missed tonight, amen. I told somebody today, I said, man, old brother Mule, every time I looked up, he's been all over the building this week, man. What is that? Come and see. Come and see. God's in the fixing business. Boy, he's in the business of taking those things that's choking. Chokeholds, chokeholds. Boy, it's so MMA stuff. He's cage fighters. Hey, God, man, if any of y'all does that, I hope you love me. These old boys, man, it ain't so much what you can do with your fist. It's getting that hold on you. And that chokehold, man, if they can ever get that chokehold on you. They got what they call tapping out. Well, I believe the devil's laughing at the church because he's got us so strange. We tapping out. All because of the distractions of our worries of this world. You know tonight, if you just change your mind, it would change your life. Don't miss what's real for the deception of the devil. Seed gets snatched, seed gets scorched, seed, seed gets strangled. Then according to verse 24 and 25, seed gets sabotaged. It talks about there's good seed sold in a field. Then it talks about while the men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and he went his way. Hear me tonight, church. God has a destiny for you. The seed of God has been sown in you, but your field also has an enemy. And that enemy is watching and waiting. Waiting on what, Brother Steve? He's waiting to catch you asleep. Because while we're asleep, he's going to come and he's going to sow. He's going to plant those weeds among the wheat. He's going to put those distractions in that will hold us back from the destiny that God has for us. See, the enemy can't stop the sowing of the good seed, so he'll try to sabotage with the bad seed. And the thing is, he's so good at it, he knows all he's got to do is plant it. Don't miss this now. He said he sowed the tares among the wheat. And does it say he stays there then? Or he, it says he went his way. He sows it and then he counts on us in our stupidness to take care of the bad seed just like we do the good seed. Counts on us to be so distracted that we care for the bad just like we do with the good. And these seeds of tares that are planted in our fields, I believe they're seeds of tares that are found in relationships. These seeds that get planted in, in our homes. You see, as the home goes, so the church will go. And there's some seeds and Boy, the, the enemy, he means to plant some seeds in these children's lives. And he means to plant some things now in their lives while they're at a young age, especially these young boys. And with this internet so available, you ought not never let your young un have the internet and go in his room where you can't see him. Because I'm telling you, as a young boy, there's some snares, there's some traps out there. And this thing of pornography and perversion and things like that, that, that the enemy is going to look to plant some seeds. See, he's going to look to put some wheat, brother, I'll say, or some tares in, in the midst of that good field. And you say, Brother Steve, my boy wouldn't do nothing like that. Yeah, right. Your boy will do anything you would have done. And you done anything you had access to. You ain't got to teach him to be a rebel, honey. It's in him. You can't set your kids up for failure. 
And my younger, they tear me up all the time. 13, 14 year old. Say, I'm going with this boy. Going with him. You 13. You ought to still have some dolls. We've, we've taken their childhoods away from them. We've wasted what's went on in our fields. And honey, they're not ready for all of that. Uh, emotionally, mentally, they're not ready for all of that. And, and we set our kids up for failure. And then we wonder when they're 25 while they're out of church and done been through two or three marriages and, and through the penal system. Brother Steve, you know about all that? Honey, if you in my church, you done been through every system of years. God raised up a place in Puntock, Mississippi for them folk that nobody else wanted. Thank God He'll do that. He didn't come to save them healthy folk. He come looking for them as sick, man. Well, there'll be some seeds and in relationships in our homes. You you better guard your field, mister. You better guard your field. It, it's not your wife's responsibility, men. It's your home. You're the head of that home. Man, it's time to buck up, get some backbone. I'm telling you, say, man, this ain't cutting it no more. Oh, to God, that your young people's testimony was. My mom and daddy loved me enough to say no. in our churches between the brethren and the sister and two amen he loves to plant those seeds the greatest enemies of the Baptist church in the fellowship are envy and jealousy cliques I hate them man I hate them do my best to keep them tore up do my best to to identify it and to preach on it and to warn people. Man, ain't no big eyes around here. I, I don't even know what anybody gives. I could care less, man. If we counting on your offering to keep the lights on, we just well as go to stacking hay in him, bro. He ain't, he ain't none of that no good, man. No, that is no. But I tell you what, that we've got something we all have to battle and we all have to fight this thing of pride and this thing of wanting to strut around a little bit and this thing of wanting to think this place won't make it without somebody like me. Boy, that's a seed that it, once it gets planted and, and in our own insecurity and in our own jealousy, uh, we'll, be, we'll be taking care of that seed. And even while we think that we're, we're producing fruit and there'll be tares among the wheat and, and all these seeds, Hear me, church, if you go to sleep spiritually, the enemy will invade your field right under your nose. He'll sow bad seed in the same field God has sown a good seed in. I'll be back in this, I'll be back around in here in August. I'll be, I'll be with Steve Miller and them in August. Well, my prayer this week is everybody that I've seen this week, sometime that week, I'll see you over there at Rock Creek. Do you know what that'll depend on? That'll depend on what you do with your field. That'll depend on what you do with the seed that the sower has sown in your life. The devil ain't going to take this laying down. Matter of fact, I got my phone numbers all around this building. I tell you what y'all do. Next week when the devil starts showing up, y'all text me and say, he's after my seed. He's after my seed. He's coming, man. He's coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Well, Brother Steve, what are we going to do? Thank God we got a master gardener, amen. Where is he, Brother Steve? Look at verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? He saith unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. 
Then the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, Bind them in bundles and burn them, But gather the wheat into my barn. What are you saying, preacher? Thank God for the good seed that's been sown in the fields of the folk in this community this week. Thank God the good seed's here. And even if we doze off and go to sleep and the enemy gets some bad seed, we have a master gardener. He'll come into our field, honey. He'll begin to gather the tares. He'll go down deep, down beneath the surface. He'll pull them up by the root. He'll bind them in bundles and burn them up. Don't be destroyed by the distractions. John 10.10 10 tells us about a thief. But then I love, you ever just, you get bits and parts of the Bible and you don't put verses together? Maybe you'll know where one verse is, but you have no idea it's tied in with another verse. John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But then Jesus says, I am. I am. Who's I am, Rusty? He I am. You can't compare him to nothing. Amen. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus is our farmer, honey. He's our master gardener, our, our master a gardener. He, he's the one who brings us the seed. He, he's the one that sows the seed. He's the one that fills your field. What are you going to do with the seed that He's sown in your field? Hear me, church. Don't let it be snatched. Don't let it be scorched. Don't let it be strained up. Don't let it be sabotaged. And some good seeds on here this week. 